Uh, good evening, everybody. And welcome to the British School and to this year's Rush Forth Lecture on Medieval Rome. Tonight, we are very happy to welcome our speaker, Claudia Bolger, but also to honour both the eponymous Gordon Rushforth, first director of the BSR, and especially John Osborne, here with us tonight, who generously set up this annual event and with his characteristic modesty, allowed his name to remain absent from its rubric. Gordon Rushforth, who took up his post at the brand new BSR in 1900, published the first and still one of the best accounts of the excavations then in course in the Forum Romanum of Santa Maria Antiqua. John Osborne, former Rome scholar and longtime friend of the school, has a good deal in common with Rushforth. During his many trips to the BSR in the 1980s and since, he has published new studies of the early medieval frescoes from Santa Maria, and he's also translated the medieval description of Rome by the English traveler Magister Gregorius, who visited the city in around 1200. And with appropriate symmetry, this was the very text that owed its first detailed archaeological commentary to the same Gordon Rushforth, who published his paper in 1919 in the Journal of Roman Studies. And so to our speaker this evening, Claudia Bolger, like John, is a well-known figure at the BSR. And also like John, she bestrides both the Italian and Anglophone fields of medieval art history. She did her PhD at Warwick with Julian Gardner, was a fellow at Pembroke College, Cambridge, and then lecturer at Edinburgh University. During this time, she co-edited with John and Rosamund McKittrick, the important collection of studies on medieval Rome, Rome across time and space, and the seminal monograph on Santa Maria in Araceli, reclaiming the Roman capital, which was published by Routledge in 2017. She has now returned to Italy, where she's Professor of Medieval Art History at the University of Udine and has in the last years been exploring the role that the movement of artists and patrons played in the transmission of artistic and architectural ideas in the Middle Ages. In 2016, she held a fellowship at CASVA in Washington DC, where she started work on a monograph on Rome in the mysterious 14th century, the Rome without the popes. And it's this fascinating topic that she will touch on tonight in a lecture which we're recording and with which our online audience can engage by sending any questions to us via the Q&A panel on your screens, entitled Nova Roma, Avignon as the New Rome and the Visual Refashioning of the Old Rome by the Avignon Papacy. Would you please welcome Claudia Bolger. Well, thank you very much, Robert, for this very, very generous uh, introduction. And thank you to Abigail for uh, inviting me to give this lecture. And also, I would like to thank um, all those scholars, uh, colleagues, students who have taken the time to uh, come here tonight and attend this lecture. And I'm told that there are over uh, 100 um, people uh, registered to watch it online. So I also thank uh, uh, those who are attending from, from a distance. Um, and I should begin by saying that um, uh, this, this a version of this paper will be uh, published in the January issue of the Burlington Magazine, and I'm grateful to the BSR for allowing me to do so. Uh, the final submission of the article is by the end of the month, uh, so there is time to incorporate corrections and suggestions from the audience. In a note to one of his maps, Opcinus de Canistris, an official uh, in the papal penitentiary during the pontificate of Clement VI, 1342-1352, referred to Avignon as Nova Roma. The idea was rooted in the canonistic formula Ubi Papa Ibi Roma, where the Pope is, there is Rome widely deployed during the 70 years of papal sojourn at Avignon. The axiom reflected the view defended by the 14th century papacy according to which the papal seat was where the Pope was currently residing and therefore not necessarily in Rome. 
The origins of this idea can be traced back to the 13th century, a period of great mobility for the Curia during which the popes were absent from Rome for more than 60 years, some 50 of which were spent in the patrimony of St. Peter and 10 more in Lyon. In 1207, William, abbot of the monastery of Andre, present-day Pé de Calais in France, arrived at Viterbo in Tuscia Romana, in Latium, where Innocent III and the Curia were then staying, and recorded the episode in these terms. Viterbium tandem de veni et ibi Romam in veni. That is, at long last I arrived in Viterbo and there I found Rome. Indeed, the biographer of Innocent IV used a similar description, Altera Roma, the other Rome, for Lyon, whence the Pope and Curia had gathered in 1245 for the First Council. Thus, the time was ripe for the evolution, a few years later, of the ecclesiological and canonistic formula Ubi Papa Ibi Roma, which served to justify the role of Avignon as a new seat for the papacy and residence for the Curia in the Trecento. Although the use of the formula or similar paraphrases is well known, to date, no single study addresses in a comprehensive manner the visual and material presence of Rome in Avignon, nor examines how art and architecture were used to create a special connection with the Eternal City. Unveiling how the popes refashioned a new image of Rome and how they constructed a very special affiliation uh, of the new or little Rome, Parva Roma as Avignon was also called, from the old Rome. I aim to explore these issues through the re-examination of a plurality of works from the 1340s, when the initial temporary residence became increasingly stationary, with many in Rome fearing that it might become permanent, until 1366, on the eve of Urban V's return in the Urbs. The newly constructed tower of the wardrobe in Clement VI Palace at Avignon contained the Pope's personal studium and in the most prominent position, in the very center of the main visual axis of the painted ceiling, two images predominated. A mother hen with her cheeks and the she-wolf with the twins. I use the verb in the past tense as the images are now in precarious state of conservation, especially the she-wolf with her twins. Of the babies, only one head is barely discernible, and I try to show it to you. Uh, no, the mouse doesn't really work. I hope you can discern it. Uh, while we can scarcely glimpse the head of the she-wolf turning towards the twins, as in the ancient Roman coins. The image was more easily uh, distinguishable 30 years ago when Christian de Merindol described it with a certain degree of accuracy. At first sight, uh, the images of Mother Hen and the She-Wolf may appear at odds with the surrounding decoration of the ceiling and of the entire chamber. In addition to the family coat of arms of the Pope, the former Pierre Roger, six red roses placed three by three on a blue background, the stem of the church, crossed keys, and that of the King of France, azure with four lilies, the ceiling mainly features images of hunting and fishing unraveling on the walls of the room, uh, the hunting of the stag, uh, sorry, uh, fishermen and animals reprised in greater detail in the famous scenes of hunting and fishing unraveling on the walls of the room. Um, the hunting of the stag being swiftly followed by that with the falcon, accompanied by colorful birds and various animals. A depiction quite rightly renowned for its careful attention to nature, which greatly impressed contemporaries to judge from its fame. The mother hen and the she-wolf, however, 
are far from being out of context. Instead, they encapsulate an idea of crucial importance to Clement VI, who commissioned the decoration of the chamber in 1343. The hen with her brood is usually considered to have been an ecclesiological symbol since early Christian times, representing the church as a protective mother who watches over her children. The she-wolf with her twins unmistakably alluded to the foundational legend of Rome. The representation of these two symbols in the place d'honneur of the chamber was more than a, and I quote, and please forgive my French, uh, a jeu d'un peintre transalpin nostalgique d'une popote éloignée du rive du Tibre au désir sacré de Roger Pierre, de le pape Clément VI, de remaner la Saint-Siège en Italie as some scholars have suggested. Others, more convincingly, have noted that they served to create a link between Avignon and Rome and celebrate the power of the church. Even more specifically, perhaps, they served to construct ancient roots by inserting Avignon and the living French Pope, whose stemmas um, are reiterated in the frieze crowning the walls, in the filiation of Rome. Indeed, these images accord well with the view of Avignon as Parva Roma or Little Rome, a concept which has thus far been given insufficient consideration in scholarship, but as we learn from Petrarch, was a common view. The poet, who instead regarded Avignon as the newest Babylon, records that it was usually called Parva Roma. Furthermore, the idea of constructing roots and displaying filiation and descendancy, which informs the images of the mother hen and the she-wolf, seems to recur in the main pictorial commissions of Clement VI in the Papal Palace, at least to judge from the extant fresco cycles, as we shall see. The painted program of the Chapel of San Marshall was realized by the pictor Pape, Matteo Giovannetti, between January 1344 and August 1345, and the dates are relevant to our discourse. At the behest of the pontiff and aimed at asserting the legitimacy of the Avignon papacy through the promotion of the cult of the titular saint. Marshall had been allegedly entrusted with the mission to evangelize Western Gaul, that is Aquitaine and the Limousine, and all Gaul by extension, by St. Peter himself. Uh, Clement VI, born in the Limousine, had the feast day of the saint moved to 7 July, that is immediately after the octave of Saints Peter and Paul, thus creating a liturgical succession. The idea that the two apostles, chief among them Peter, were succeeded by Marshall was visually reiterated on both the walls and the vault of the chapel, displaying episodes of St. Marshall's life based on two main sources. The 11th century pseudo-Aurelian Vita, attributed to Ademar de Chaban, and the nearly contemporary 1320s life by Bernard Gui, a friend of Clement VI. To render the narrative more clearly legible and intelligible in the correct sequence of the events, the painter used captions, a common device, and letters in alphabetical order from A to V, a very original solution. The special relationship between the Prince of the Apostles and Marshall informs several scenes. In the vault, the baptism of Marshall by Peter, which is seen e, a, a, the arrival in Rome of Marshall and his two disciples accompanied by Peter, seen C, which combines two episodes. Christ ordering St. Peter to send Marshall to preach in Gaul and St. Peter communicating Christ's will to Marshall and his disciples. Uh, and the moment when Marshall returns to Rome after the death of his disciple Austriclianus uh, in scene D, which also combines two events, Marshall reception 
of an oversized pastoral baculus, a monumental baton topped by a cross from Peter, and the resurrection of Austriclianus performed by Marshall with the baculus. The walls of the chapel feature miracles operated by Marshall, the evangelization of the limousine, including the extraordinary depiction of those churches founded there by him, uh, but resembling uh, the Romanesque and Gothic churches actually built in the Comtat Venassin, uh, followed by the scenes of his death and glorification. In the lunette of the west wall, just above the door, is one of the key scenes. Christ revealing to Marshall in a vision the martyrdom of Peter and Paul in Rome, with a caption taken from the text of Bernard Gui. Following the death of the apostles, Marshall, new apostle, will continue the work of Christ. The overall message of the cycle was clear, as Marshall was the heir to Peter and Paul, so Avignon was the heir to Rome. While we concur with this reading of the frescoes as a visual legitimization of the Avignon papacy and a, um, I quote, misunderstand the pouvoir pontifical, we believe that it is possible to refine such reading by calling attention to some details that have hitherto been overlooked and that enhance our understanding of the dense and subtly nuanced message conveyed by the fresco program. These details reveal a special and specific attention to Rome. The urbs is present not only materially through the fictitious cosmatesque frames that border all the scenes, cover the ribs of the vaults, and extend to cover even the traceries of the windows, transforming the entire chapel into a kind of precious cosmatesque reliquary. But it, it is also present in the painted cosmatesque mosaics, originally embellished with precious metal finishes, which cover all painted buildings, whether the scene is set in Rome or not. Thus visually evoking the pervasive presence of the papacy through reference to a distinctive language, the cosmati style, associated with papal and curial patronage in Rome and the patrimony for at least three centuries. More specifically, the urbs is evoked as the place of origin of pastoral power through the transmission of the baculus from Peter to Marshall, while it is physically present as the place of martyrdom of Peter and Paul. Here, in the background of the crucifixion of St. Peter, the round plan building on two levels with the central round tower-like structure visible on the right-hand side is almost certainly a representation of the Castrum Sancti Angeli, part of the Vatican Borgo. The Castrum featured in the background of the earlier depiction of the crucifixion of St. Peter in the Santa Santorum. The crenellated walls are those of the Leonine city, while the tower may be the lost turreted access structure to the Ponte Sant'Angelo, or may more generally represent the fortified towering buildings of the medieval Vatican Palace. There is also a significant detail. The rooster that crowd when Peter denied Christ, which qualifies the apostle as the model example par excellence of repentance and contrition. All three synoptic gospels report that Peter wept after his triple denial and that the recognition of his denial had been prompted by the rooster's crow. As is well known during the Last Supper, Jesus predicted that Peter would deny any knowledge of or relationship with him by disowning him three times before the rooster was to crow the next morning. When the rooster crowed, Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken and wept bitterly. 
Functioning as a mnemonic stimulus to recall to memory Christ's word, the rooster provoked the acknowledgement of the sin and induced contrition and repentance. What is interesting for our discourse is that in Old St. Peter's, there was indeed a rooster, which still survives today. Made of gilded bronze, gold-plated in the 17th century, of course, and difficult to date, it has been dated between the 9th and the 12th century. It served as a reminder of the sin, and especially of the perfect repentance and consequent pardon received by Peter. It reminded the faithful of the Lord's infinite mercy towards genuinely repentant sinners. Little known, it is displayed in a rather neglected window in the Museum of the Treasury of St. Peter in the Vatican. In Giovannetti's painting, the rooster appears atop a pyramidal building set just behind the angels carrying the animal of Peter in the form of a white-dressed figure supported by the celestial hands, as if he were enthroned. This building is most probably to be identified with what was known in medieval texts as the Meta Romuli, an ancient funerary monument originally located at the beginning of the modern Via della Conciliazione and resembling the pyramid of Caius Cestius, which still survives near Porta San Paolo. From at least the mid-11th century onwards, the Vatican pyramid was believed to be the tomb of Romulus, one of the legendary founders of the city, an identification recorded in the Mirabilia Urbis Rome, in Magister Gregorius' account of his visit to Rome, as well as many other texts. And on this, I refer you to the seminal article by John Osborne uh, concerning the pilgrim's route to St. Peter's. To the extreme left of this group of buildings, we can clearly discern the upper part of a conic monument with a foliated finial on top. This building can be identified with the Therabintum of Nero, described in medieval sources as the place where St. Peter was crucified. Indeed, uh, according to a medieval tradition, St. Peter had been crucified inter duas metas, and these two buildings, the Meta Romuli and the Terebintum, appeared in the lost depiction of the martyrdom of St. Peter in the atrium of Old St. Peter's, documented by a drawing in Grimaldi's album and dating to circa 1277-1280. And in the note um, uh, by Grimaldi, you can read Crucifixio Beati Petri inter duas metas. Uh, the site of St. Peter's martyrdom, thus depicted, was repeated almost immediately in the Assisi frescoes, in the right transept, and in those of San Piero a Grado in Pisa, as well as, shortly afterwards, in the Stefaneschi polyptic by Giotto. These monuments marked the road to the shrine of St. Peter. By the date of the Avignon frescoes were made, this was the most complete image of the Vatican that had been depicted. While Rome is presented here as, uh, as the repository of the relics of St. Peter and St. Paul, in another very distinctive episode in the narrative, scene M, the city is presented as a specific place of pilgrimage. The scene is depicted on the south wall to the left of the central window. It features the moment when Stephen, Duke of Southwest France, following the advice of Marshall, arrives in Rome to ask Peter to absolve his sins. He had decapitated the Virgin Valeria for refusing to marry him, as recounted in a previous scene. It is usually said that the event served to stress the merits of Marshall before Peter. It was Marshall who asked the Duke to go to Rome and meet Peter, and that it was important for the patron who aimed at presenting himself as a descendant of the Apostle. While this reading is correct, there is much more in this depiction. The episode is set in Rome, as the caption clearly states. It is difficult to say whether a real space is alluded to here, 
It might be the main arm of the quadriportico of old St. Peter's or an inner space. The marble plutae remind us of the choir precinct or scoli cantorum, which served as special divides within sacred spaces. What is clear is that Peter appears on a threshold, which suggests a liminal space. Stephen bent on both knees, barefoot, his head and back bent under the weight of sin, seems to be holding his arms and twinned on his chest, a gesture of humble reception of grace. A monumental St. Peter peremptorily extends his arm over the Duke and, with a long staff, imparts absolution. The urbs is the goal for absolution of sins through the very presentia of Peter in the Vatican. It seems clear that Clement VI, who certainly played a major role in devising the pictorial program, aimed at presenting Rome as both the site of the martyrdom of both Peter and Paul, and thus as a repository of their relics, and the place to go to be granted pardon. The message, therefore, was not only about creating a descendancy from Peter to Marshall and then to Clement VI, but was also about crafting a highly specific image of Rome, whose uniqueness resided in the presence of the holy remains of St. Peter and St. Paul. While Rome could be replaced as the seat of the papacy, it could not be substituted as the pilgrim's goal for visiting the tombs of the martyrs, for asking pardon and for receiving absolution from St. Peter. It has not yet been noticed that this scene reflects the topical attitude of the Pope towards Rome in the years during which the, ch the chapel was being painted. In other words, it reflects the very way in which the Pope wanted Rome to be seen. As a matter of fact, in November 1342, a delegation of no fewer than 18 Romans, led by the two senators in office and including such influential citizens as Lello Stefani de Tosetti, friend of Petrarch, had met the Pope in Avignon to petition the return of the papal seat from the banks of the Rhone to those of the Tiber and to request a jubilee in 1350. While the first plea remained unanswered, the pontiff discussed the second at length with the cardinals and pronounced his final response in a solemn assembly in the consistory hall on 21 January 1343, following which he promulgated the bull Unigenitus Dei Filius, announcing a jubilee in Rome in 1350. Apart from being a visual affirmation of the Avignon papacy, the frescoes of the chapel of St. Marshall were the expression of the Pope's promotion of Rome as the pilgrim's goal for pardon. Thus, on the one hand, Avignon was presented as the legitimate seat of the papacy, and on the other, the role of Rome was redefined as the destination of the forthcoming jubilee, diverting attention from its former role as the seat of the papacy. Immediately after the promulgation of the papal bull, Cola di Rienzo, who was in Avignon in order to present his political program to the pontiff, wrote to the Senate and people of Rome, urging them to install an image of the Pope sculpted in gold and purple in the Roman amphitheater or on the Capitol, so that the memory of the pontiff lasted in perpetuity. He went as far as to draw a parallel with the, I quote, solemnes effigies in preciosis lapidibus sculptas, and of quote, of the ancient liberatores patriae, such as Scipio and Caesar. While Caesar, while Cola's ambitious idea does not seem to have been realized, a statue of Clement VI with the breve concerning the Jubilee was actually erected at the behest of brother Jacobus, a member of the delegation. The monument was installed in the hospital of Santo Spirito in Sassia, where the friar served as both magister et prepositus. An epigraph on which only a fragment survives explained the commission through the desire to commemorate in perpetuity the pontiff and the success of the Roman ambassadors. An additional verse inscription on the base of the monument stated that 
Pope Clement, whom the present statue sculpted in marble represents, in Latin, quem sculpta presents figura marmore docet, washing away the crimes of the sinners reduced from 100 to 50 the time between jubilees in the year 1343. Both the ambitious proposal of Cola di Rienzo and the monumental visual response of Rome to the action of Clement VI in favor of the urbs are relevant for our discourse as they can only be understood in my view in the light of Clement VI's unfettered passion for self-portraiture attested not only by his painted portraits in the papal palace, but also by wax statues of himself commissioned for the church of San Maximen and for the Benedictine Abbey of Luscious Dieu. The first, according to an extant payment of 7 February 1343, was polychrome, while the second was privated by finest gold leaves. In this context, Cola's idea, which at first sight may appear the imaginary product of a visionary mind, acquires a different meaning. It must in fact have sprung from the knowledge, be this direct or more probably indirect, of the Papal Commission for San Maximen and perhaps others, and from the consequent understanding that the Pope would have been greatly pleased by the erection of a monumental statue of himself in gold and purple in a highly symbolic central position in Rome. The powerful Magister Jacobus, prepositus of the hospital, must have been similarly aware that the Pope would have appreciated an expression of gratitude in the form of a marble three-dimensional immortalization of his gesture. These little Roman, uh, Roman statues have never been considered in the light of the French ones, nor have the French statues have been associated with the Roman ones. Research on Avignon has not been much in dialogue with that on Rome and vice versa. The statue of Clement VI in Rome, however, be this virtual, such as that invoked by Cola, or real, like that of Magister Jacobus, need to be read in the context of what was being commissioned by the Pope above in and from Avignon. To return to the decoration of the chapel of St. Marshall, another connection with Rome is worth stressing. On the south wall to the sides of the window are the posthumous miracles of St. Marshall. To the right, the disciple Alpinianus cures the six by imposing on them the sudarium of Marshall. This is sin U. Unfortunately, the scene is severely damaged, but the legend is clear on the content. I read it in Latin and then I give you the translation. Qualiter sanctus alpinianus, cum sudario beati marcialis, multos infirmos a diversis infirmitatibus oppressos sanavit. That is how Saint Alpinianus cured many sick people oppressed by various diseases with the shroud of blessed Marshall. When the frescoes were fully legible, the Sudarium of San Marshall must have resonated with the Veronica or Sudarium or Holy Face of Christ, the most venerable and venerated relic of Rome in the Trecento displayed in Old St. Peter's, painted on the keystone of the cross vault of the chapel. Thus the visual association of the Sudarium of Christ and that of San Marshall, a local relic, be it enshrined in the chapel or simply depicted, must have additionally contributed to presenting Avignon as Parva Roma. In the bull Unigenitus Dei Filius announcing the Jubilee, Clement VI added St. John Lateran to the list of the basilicas, St. Peter's and St. Paul outside the walls, that had to be visited to gain indulgences. It is perhaps not coincidental that soon afterwards he began the construction of a chapel dedicated to St. John in the Papal Palace, decorated between 1346 and 1348 with episodes of the life of the evangelists on the west and south walls and the Baptist east and north walls, the same dedicatees as in the Lateran Basilica. Pope Benedict XII, 1334, 1342, had already dedicated the main chapel, the Cappella Magna of the palace, to St. John 
Um, and, and between 1346 and 1351, Clement VI had a new larger Cappella Magna in honor of St. Pe built in honor of St. Peter in his extension of the palace and serving as the Palatine Chapel. St. Peter and St. John, the Vatican and the Lateran, as Schimmel Fennig and Faravicini Bagliani have argued, by building a chapel dedicated to the Prince of the Apostles and another consecrated to St. John, Clement VI was reproducing the major, the major loci of the sacred topography of Rome. Thus, the Papal Palace could be seen as a sort of symbolic ersatz of the topography of Papal power and authority in Rome. Christian Heck has further contended that the depiction of a now almost entirely lost crucifixion in the consistory hall, combined with the program of the new chapel of St. John, which opened into uh, the consistory hall, is to be read as an intentional reference to the Lateran. At the Lateran baptistry in the 5th century, Pope Hilarus 461-468 had built three chapels dedicated to St. John Baptist, St. John Evangelist, and the Holy Cross. Circa 40 years later, Pope Symmachus, 498-514, uh, at the center of a schism for a simultaneous election of two popes, repaired to the Vatican, where he built three chapels with exactly the same dedication as those erected by Hilarus. Such a creation of a an autre latran is to be explained, according to Heck, with the papal intention to mieux affirmer la légitimité de son élection. Other analogous references to the Lateran throughout the centuries can be read in the same light. Similarly, Heck argues, the decoration of the chapel of St. John in the Papal Palace at Avignon, associated with the representation of the crucifixion in the consistory hall and the crucifixion in the chapel of St. Marshall, which included the two St. John's, is to be read as a reference to the Lateran in order to present Avignon as New Rome, either to consolidate the legitimacy of the Avignon papacy or to respond to the attacks of those questioning such legitimacy. Painted on the vault of the chapel are the two St. John's, their parents and members of their families, including unusual saints, such as Santa Ismeria, sister of Anna and mother of Elizabeth, whose presence serves to reinforce the relationship between the two families. These depictions are generally unexplained and simply seen as expression of the, I quote, particularly innovative character of the Avignon paintings, end of quote. However, such an impressive display of genealogy may perhaps be better understood as part of that broader program of exhibiting descendants of which we have already seen several signs, especially if we consider that on the keystone of the cross vault of the chapel, I hope you can see it, in the same position as the Veronica in the chapel of St. Marshall are the coats of arms of Clement VI. The building which, above all, must have served to encourage the perception of Avignon as the new Rome, however, was not the commission of Clement VI, but rather of Urban V, <coughs> who, albeit only temporarily, 1367-1369, was soon to return the papal seat to Rome. Urban's passion for the urbs was implicit in his very name, and the building in question, a new wing of the papal palace, was itself called Roma. It is one of the most enigmatic buildings erected in Avignon in the Trecento. According to Castelnuovo, its construction was completed in August 1365 under the direction, I quote, of Goslin de Pradel, scriptor penitentiarie and direc director uh, operum palazzi domini nostri Rome. Castelnuovo refers to Munz and Schaeffer for this information with no specific uh, page number. Yet the detailed and thoroughly scrutiny of all the documents concerning Avignon published by the French and German scholars reveals that Goslin de Pradel was scriptor penitentiarie, pecuniarum camera apostolice receptor, and 
vice tesaurarius pape, not director operum. In Avignon, he is documented in various money transactions on behalf of the Pope, but not concerning building works or payments of artists. He was sent to Rome in 1367, remaining there when Urban V returned to Avignon in 1369. In Rome, Goslin is recorded as supervising works in the Apostolic Palace. Between August 1367 and February 1368, several payments are made to Goslin, described as, I quote, scriptor penitenziarie, director operum palaci de urbe pro peribus et reparationibus palaci apostolici Rome. It thus emerges that Castelnuovo's quote must have in fact referred to the papal palace in Rome, not to a part of the Avignonese palace called Roma. Several scholars nevertheless have built on this statement, such as Fausto Piola Caselli, who maintained that, I quote, the Roma was so named after one of its paintings, da una delle sue pitture. Although this claim is not supported by a source reference, it has been repeated in subsequent scholarship, including most recent publications. Dominique Vintain, in her work dedicated to the Papal Palace in Avignon, identified the director of the works at the time of Urban V with Bertrand de Nogueirol and dated the construction of the Roma between June 1364 and August 1365. The re-examination of the documents edited by Schaeffer confirms that such accounts indeed describe Bertrand de Nogueirol as director operum pape in relation to building works and repairs in the Avignon Palace and detail payments to Giovannetti and several other painters between November 1365 and September 1366. The problem is that none of these documents refer to a building called the Roma. When they mention building works, uh, not merely salaries or purchase of materials, they refer to a viridarium, a garden, an old and new viridarium, and an edifice of the viridarium, but no Roma at all. At this point in my research, I began to wonder whether I was dealing with a historiographical myth Laband, Gardnier, and Vintain have identified the Roma, that is the new wing of the palace built by Urban V, with a rectangular building, um, number uh, eight on the plan, with the red circle, uh, situated in, in the gardens of Benedict XII, to the south of the ornamental gardens, consisting of a long gallery, probably on three levels. The ground floor comprised the three arches resting on four monumental pillars, whose lower portions are still in situ. Thus, it appeared as an open gallery supporting one or two stories, which offered a view of the majestic fountain of the Griffin. This wing of the palace was demolished between 1801, 1802, and 1837, and only few 17th-century views of the east side of the palace, taken from the northeast, provide some partial glimpses into its appearance. As its lower part is hidden behind the buildings of Benedict XII and Clement VI, all that can be discerned is the top story, which differs in the details. These drawings displace two windows on the short side and three on the long side, while another shows four rectangular windows on the long side and four smaller trabeated double openings at an upper level. The rectangular windows may have been originally pointed and turned into rectangular openings in the early modern ages, which was a common practice. The rectangular building was connected to the papal apartment via the old tower of the studium to the southwest. Unfortunately, we know nothing about its use and decoration as the documents only record the payments for salaries and supply of colors, including significant amounts of azure. Thus, while the location and general appearance of the new building erected at the behest of Urban V can be reconstructed with a certain degree of confidence, what evidence is there for it being called the Roma? 
Are we facing then a historiographical myth deriving from an initial misunderstanding of a source transmitted, enlarged, and cemented to the point of becoming a fact? The answer must be in the negative. In terms of archival sources, a document of 8 July 1381 in the Avignonis register of accounts attest to the payment of the painter Guillaume Bonjean for the purchase of colors and materials necessary to paint the Cappellam Novam Fatam in Camera Rome. Perhaps it was a little private chapel in the pontiff's chamber in the Roma. In any event, by 1381, a part of the palace was undoubtedly known as the Roma. At this date, however, Urban V was already dead. Does any earlier source refer to the new part of the palace with this appellation? In the case of Trecento Avignon, there survives so much archival material, at least compared with Rome in the earlier and same century, that the lives of the pontiffs tend to be overlooked. In fact, I was able to locate the most eloquent source concerning the Roma in one of the lives of Urban V, the so-called Prima Vita, significantly written by a coeval biographer. The, rele the relevant passage reads, um, Dictus etiam urbanus papa, quasi a principio sui pontificatus, in plerisque locis continue edificavit. Et primo in palazzo avenionensi, quod in magna parte ampliavit, in illa videlicet que, odie vulgariter Roma appellatur, in qua facte camere, abitaziones, deambulatoria, et viridarium mire pulcritudinis et amenitatis, abent in se maiorem delectabilitatem, quam etiam quecunque in alio toto palazio existentes. Also, the said Pope, almost at the beginning of his pontificate, built endlessly in many places, and first in the Avignon Palace, which he enlarged in great part, namely in that which today is commonly called Roma, in which were built chambers, dwellings, porticos, and the garden of admirable beauty and amenity, which were most delightful than any other in the whole palace. This life Life survives in at least five manuscripts, three of which preserved at the BNF, one in the Library of Toulouse, and one in the Vatican Library. The latter omits vulgariter. It is in Latin, but many clues tell us that its author was Provencal and wrote at the time of Gregory XI, Urban V's successor, whose pontificate spans from 1370 to 1378. Albeit the most detailed, this is not the earlier source attesting that the new wing of the palace was known as the Roma. Indeed, already by the end of June 1366, Roma's fame had spread well beyond the walls of Avignon. It is recorded in a long epistle sent from Venice by Petrarch to Urban V, aimed at persuading him to return the papal seat to the Eternal City. Fama est palazzi tui partem, que Roma dicitur, quam ingressus sponse terre di disse totunque prorsus implesse Romani pontificis officium videare. It is said that there is a part of your palace called Roma, entering which you believe to have returned to your spouse, Rome of course, and to have totally fulfilled your role of Roman pontiff. Beyond the rhetoric of the written word, the common understanding must have been that the pontiff felt himself to be in Rome and was perceived as such whilst he was living in this part of the palace. It is impossible to say whether this perception was created by the architecture or its decoration, but it is likely that the Roma evoked the urbs not only by its name, but for its recreation of Rome within Avignon. 
In conclusion, I hope to have demonstrated how art and architecture in Trecento Avignon was used by Pope Clement VI and his advisors to articulate sophisticated discourses about Avignon as New Rome or Little Rome, as well as to recast the image of Old Rome, diverting attention from its role as the seat of the papacy and turning it into the place par excellence to seek pardon. I also hope to have shown that proposed or actual artistic commissions in Rome at the time can only be explained in the light of papal patronage in Avignon. Clement VI's unfettered passion for three-dimensional self-portraits was probably behind Cola di Rienzo's proposal of erecting golden and purple statue of the Pope in a very prominent location, as well as behind the actual making of a marble statue of the same pontiff in the hospital of Santo Spirito at the behest of the Prepostus Jacobus. While Clement VI created a distance between Avignon and Rome, attempting to define the two as different cities with clearly distinct characteristics, the first daughter of the other, Urban V did almost the contrary, erasing such distance. The Pope, whose mind was already in the urbs, as his chosen name suggests, extended the Abignonese palace by building a wing commonly known as Roma, where, according to contemporaries, he retreated as if he were already in the Eternal City, perhaps in preparation of the shortly forthcoming move. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much, Claudia, for a, a, beautif a beautifully and lavishly illustrated uh, exposition of, of um, what to this uh, non-expert at least seems an extremely original theme, this idea of uh, drawing close and significant parallels uh, between Rome and Avignon. Uh, and as you say, they, they seem to tell us uh, more about what uh, was considered important about Rome, specifically in the 14th century, the contemporary idea. Um, is it possible, and we've got questions obviously from the experts in the audience and possibly uh, online as well, um, but is it possible before we start, if I could just push you a little bit more about this mysterious Roma, uh, where the Pope felt that he really was in Rome. Um, you said we we might imagine frescoes or the architecture, but you, you're not quite sure. Have you speculated to yourself? Or uh, have been, no, because been... I think scholars have speculated so much uh, in the sense that um, uh, they they didn't even know what they were talking about, clearly. I mean, that there was an idea uh, that this part of uh, the palace was called Roma, but uh, it was so long repeated and uh, they built upon it. And yes, perhaps there was a map of Rome as the one, you know, uh, that is in Siena, in the Palazzo Publico. Uh, it's, it is just that, you know, uh, as scholars have stated, there was. And there is no evidence for that. Perhaps we could just say, yes, maybe there was. Or, uh, I mean, I've been thinking, but obviously it's, it's just uh, speculative thinking. Uh, since the documents actually talk of a viridarium, yes, a new viridarium, an old viridarium, an edifice in the viridarium, and, uh, and uh, with the archaeology, it has been reconstructed where this garden was and was much larger than the previous one. I wonder whether uh, it was that part of the Vatican Palace which had a garden ah, right. that might have been somehow reproduced. Uh, or reproduced. Uh, uh, it's just a question because when Urban V goes um, back to Rome uh, among the various works uh, at the Vatican, he also promotes works in the garden and in the vineyard and so on. So I wonder whether there was also that. Or, of course, as I said, an image of Rome, there could be a possibility. But do you have an idea? I mean, what else could we speculate or think? If, uh, you, you'd cancel the Lateran altogether. It couldn't be something in the actual Lateran. Um, I was thinking of the, the, the deambulatories that are mentioned and the um the camera and the, uh, although I don't well, I mean if well. if the building was was the uh, I mean if scholars are right in uh, uh, identifying it with uh, with with the number eight so yeah. that that uh, long gallery uh, with a sort of portico um, entrance on three big pillars you know I'm talking about. <laughs> 
it was just a long gallery with perhaps one or two stories. What, what was the fountain of the Griffin? Uh, that was earlier. That was not it. Uh, oh. was and was the one you see just in front of the Ah, okay. Sorry. Um, I, I have the bad habit of moving around. Uh, um, the Fountain of the Griffin was, uh, as we know, uh, built by Clement the Sixth, And there are sort of traces, but not, nothing more. But we know that was a majestic um, fountain. So it was uh, on one side was overlooking that. Um, uh, so... Um, was it a statue of a griffin? Yes, indeed. Yes, that, that, that's what is what is what is. I, I can see. Likely, I. John Osborne has already got his uh, hand up, so uh, I, we should, uh, we should yeah. hand the microphone to yeah, John yeah. for a question. Uh, Thank you, Claudia, for this lovely talk. Um, I was just thinking that if I had been Urban V and I was trying to recreate Rome and Avignon, I might have done two things. I just wondered if there's any evidence for either of them. One is I would have installed a chapel dedicated to San Lorenzo, who uh, was very important in the Papal Palace in Rome and also is a very quintessential Roman saint, unlike the others. And I would have put uh, up some statuary uh, in outside somewhere in the portico to give the sense of uh, this is a place of power and importance. And is there any evidence for either of those? Uh, um, uh, thank you, John. Uh, yes, what you say is uh, is logical. Uh, as what we know for sure is that uh, this was a gallery-like structure, and that the chapel, uh, a cappella, uh, was built only later, in 1381, uh, so um, much later, and this is uh, the one uh, in the Camera Rome. So um, this was a sort of private apartment of the Pope, and the, the cappella, uh, of which we know nothing about the dedication, the only document that we have is this one of 1381, so much later, uh, talks about uh, this French painter having to pick the, the cappella novam in camere Rome. So, in camera Rome. This is all what we have. So, uh, there was not yet a chapel, maybe because uh, he left for Rome, and so the chapel was built later, but they were planning of having a chapel there, and who knows? In, in, in that case, it might have been dedicated to St. Lawrence, and we have uh, no um, a reference of a chapel built in honor of St. Lawrence uh, in, the, in the palace. And uh, as for the statues, of course, and the fountain of the griffin uh, very likely had the statue of the griffin, but we don't know whether it was an ancient one. We don't have evidence of bringing statues. I've, I've looked at all the documents and, and that's many of them, but they don't talk about bringing ancient statues. Uh, I was even interested in uh, sort of finding out whether the pavements were Cosmati-like pavements, so since there was such a, a sort of a, a Cosmatesque obsession, you know, all the uh, ribs of the vaults were decorated with fictitious Cosmati um, patterns. The uh, tracery of the window was covered with this uh, geometric cosmetic patterns. Uh, the restorers even uh, found out that some of them were uh, gilt originally, so they were embellished with metal finishing, all of these uh, cosmetic details. So I wondered whether there was also cosmetic pavement, and I asked uh, obviously, in the Papal Palace, all the colleagues there. I, I must thank uh, especially Dominique Vintin and uh, um, Jacques Gallon for uh, all the help uh, in, um, in with research in the in the Avignon Palace and also for for some of the images. Um, uh, but they said. Mm, that many of these chapels obviously at a, a higher level and the marble pavement would have been quite heavy. There is no trace of such mm, marbles having remained and of course no trace of ancient marbles being brought there, even if obviously Provence had uh, presumably had you know ancient statues and some 
marbles there, you know, as well from Roman times. Uh, but the pavements were, uh, I'm told from the traces that we have uh, tiles, for instance, not marbles. So uh, this is this is what we know, but they're all modern now, you know, and, and, and the worst is that many distractions happened in the 19th century, you know, just after the French Revolution, when the barracks were installed in this, um, in this chapel and uh, some of the frescoes were detached and sold uh, by the soldiers in the black market, so. Uh, do we have any other questions from the floor? Um, if not, we have some online questions. Um, and carrying on from the, the, the question of, of statues, uh, Peter Clark asks... Um, Hi, Peter. <laughs> in authorizing images of himself, uh, did not Pope Clement VI run the risk of the charge of idolatry as leveled against Boniface VIII for doing the same 50 years earlier? Yes, I, I thank you, Peter. Uh, it's a very good question. I asked it uh, myself. Uh, it is evident that um, by this time, um, there was no longer a problem of idolatry. Of course, in the case of Boniface VIII, uh, probably that was a sort of, a, of an excuse or you know, that wasn't the main problem with Boniface VIII uh, for uh, the French. Uh, certainly, certainly, we know that uh, the scholars have even, and I think they are quite right for a number of reasons that I'm not, uh, I, can't, I think I don't have the time to uh, uh, explain here, uh, said that uh, um, he was uh, uh, adumbrated in Marshall. So the painted portraits of himself uh, that are very similar to the images of some marshal. So um, uh, he was even, you know, putting his kind of crypto portrait in the image of some marshal and was commissioning this uh, box statues covered with gold, you know, coated in gold, not only polychrome. Uh, and uh, uh, at this moment, obviously, uh, that was not a problem. Uh, and the only reason I can think of is that um, some time has lapsed, but also Boniface VIII was problematic for for many reasons, and um, and and so they uh, used idolatry and as sort of excuse to make some accusations. Um, sorry, if the, it's, a, it's a rather simplified question, uh, but uh, maybe we can exchange emails about this. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Is this um, on? Yeah. Um, uh, um, ubi, ubi Papa Ibi Roma, which is how, how you began, and some of the projects that you were showing seem to be trying to put that in, in pictures. Um, though some of the others that you started discussing towards the end seem to rather be kind of turning it around and a bit of an anxiety about Ubi Roma Ibi Papa. Um, uh, is that uh, a characterization that you'd recognize? And if so, is it also an anxiety that you'd recognize that would kind of, that would kind of uh, be in alignment with uh, other debates going on in the Curia and around and around that, in which we can see through other sources the papacy engaging and responding to and changing of how course. it exchanges with that? And and would you align them? Could you align them? actually really quite well in terms of dates, times, projects, and so on. Of course, this was a, uh, I mean, it would have taken uh, much time to just contextualize the problem, but of course, this was a hotly debated question. And in Rome, uh, they were sending ambassadors uh, frequently to Avignon. They were, uh, you know, Petrarch uh, wrote uh, several epistles to call the popes back. This was a, a hotly debated uh, issue. And Urban Defeat was very sensible and sensitive to this because he then decided to return the papal seat. So with the building of the Roma, we are just on the eve of uh, returning uh, to, uh, to Rome. Uh, difficult to say whether he had already uh, made up his mind uh, in 1366. Uh, probably uh, he was 
just about to do so, but but yes. Uh, so the the question was um, hotly debated, and of course there is a shift uh, between um, what Clement VI does uh, in presenting Rome and what Urban V uh, Urban V does. In my view, even if you know for for Clement VI, I can use paintings and pictorial programs, and for Urban V, uh, all what I can use is the uh, is this kind of documents in Avignon. When it goes back to Rome. Uh, uh, what he does, he uh, makes the Lateran the center of Western Christendom. So he does everything he, he can to make sure that uh, the Lateran is again the center of Western Christendom and uses art again to do so. He builds a monumental tabernacle over the high altar of St. John Lateran, which is the one still existing today for the heads of Peter and Paul, which were in the Santa Santorum, so in the Palatine Chapel dedicated to St. Lawrence, he moves them out of, say, private chapel, and he brings them over the high altar of the Cathedral of Rome in a monumental Gothic ciborium uh, uh, on which they, were, they could be displayed to the people. And actually, even before commissioning uh, the building of this tabernacle and very precious uh, bust reliquaries to uh, a goldsmith worker who came with him from Avignon uh, to uh, you know, encapsulating even more uh, monumental reliquaries, these images, he uh, makes an ostension of the relics to the Roman people. So, so when he goes back, he uh, tries to legitimize again the role of Rome as the center of Western Christendom. So he had already this in mind. Um, uh, this is how, this is the attitude of Urban V. I don't know if I have answered your, your question. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, Leslie, question from Leslie Brubeck. Thank Do I have to turn? Oh, it's okay. I'm a Byzantinist. I have never heard of St. Marshall in my life. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I have to confess. Uh -huh. So I'm glad to be introduced to this person. Uh, yeah, Tom is saying he has. Well, of course you have, Tom. But anyway, what I'm curious about is, was this something that only Clement, was Clement just really into St. Marshall? Did Urban continue this when they go back to Rome? Do they sort of take... It's Marshall uh, with them, or is he very much an an Avignon? Because I think you could play a lot with that, actually, if that's the case. That's all. Um, so uh, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, Marshall is uh, Clement the Sixth uh, um, choice because Marshall was uh, a saint from the Limousine, and Clement the Sixth was born in the Limousine. So uh, Marshall had evangelized. Um, uh, the Lim Aquitaine and the Limousine and Gaul by extension, and uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, taken by uh, Clement the Sixth uh, in order to, you know, promote a kind of almost family saint, if you like. Um, so definitely, it is uh, Clement the Sixth uh, choice, and it's only with Clement the Sixth that there is this promotion of uh, Saint Marshall. Um, and so, what would be interesting to know? But again, you know, I, I desperately try to find information about this. If whether the shroud of Saint Marshall was actually enshrined in the chapel, but couldn't find any document mentioning this. Uh, these uh, documents always say he consecrated the altar with many relics. And unfortunately, our, you know, uh, inscriptions would have been very useful as we have many for Rome, but we don't for, for Avignon. I don't know if I answered your question. Rosamond. Oh, sorry, no, Costas. Oh, Thank you, Claudia. I was wondering whether it would be possible to think of the French attitude to Avignon in the light of their own long tradition of various Episcopal cities creating themselves as virtual reproductions of Rome with particular stational churches, stational liturgy. Is there any way in which Avignon is perceived as another example of these recreated Romes, as far as the French are concerned. 
I think so. Yes, you are. You are absolutely right. Uh, this is probably the case. Uh, I don't know what city specifically you are thinking of, but definitely, you know, the, the cases I cited, uh, uh, Lyon um, more than anyone else, uh, because Lyon was the place where uh, the popes resided most uh, before. You know, in, in the previous century for sure, but you know, even in the earlier ones. Uh, and so, yes, uh, I don't know if anyone has studied Lyon with specific attention to this, um, uh, but certainly, you know, Innocent IV calls it Altera Roma when they gathered there because the Curia was there. So for them, uh, it was because the Curia was there, but whether, you know, the buildings also recreated, that would be interesting to explore, I think. I don't know if scholars working on Lyon. As I tried to, to connect scholarship on Avignon uh, with scholarship on Rome, but obviously that can be done much more broadly and widely. So thanks for the suggestion also. Thank, thank you very much for your fascinating presentation. I was intrigued by the Latin adverb vulgariter in one of the manuscript witnesses that you showed us. And uh, I want. I was wondering, what does that mean? Mm. Does vulgariter mean in this sentence, vulgariter, Roma, uh, uh, dicitur, or whatever the verb was, does vulgariter here mean that everyone calls this building Roma? And I think you suggested this when you very reasonably translated it commonly called, or does it mean that it had a different name, but commonly it is called Roma? Oh, thank you for, it's a very good question. Uh, um, I, I must specify that there are five uh, manuscripts uh, surviving of the life of Urban V, and four of them uh, use vulgariter. Only the one in the Vatican Library doesn't have vulgariter, so four of them have vulgariter. Uh, and I wondered uh, what exactly meant. Um, obviously, it could mean that uh, in the vulgare, it's, it's called Roma, no? So it's commonly called Roma or it's in the vulgare. But we do have two scholars, two specialists, Monica in particular, you work on Petrarch and, uh, you know, you are the specialist. So Monica Berte is a specialist of uh, Petrarch and Trecento Italian literature, I would say, and Maurizio Campanelli too is, is an expert of Latin. So I think the two of them can answer better than me. If you have suggestions, Please tell us. Well, uh, what can we bring the microphone? Yes. Perfect. me in this stadium. Uh, no, as far as I know, in the in the fifteenth century, vulgo vulgar. Yes. Because the manuscript, I mean, the manuscript is actually late fourteenth century, yes. but then so, they are written in the fifteenth. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know about the uh, 14th century, not so much, but in, in humanistic period, this 15th century, vulgo vulgari der vernaculo, uh, means uh, in vernacular. Uh, but in that context, I I really don't know vulgari der. I, I want... Because I, I, I can't believe that they called Roma, they used Roma in... Uh, in old French, in Provençal, in the language they used uh, in that palace. <laughs> yes, because when it's in Latin, they used another word. Uh, uh, the manuscript has many. Uh... I, I think, sorry, yeah. it, perhaps uh, it could seem banal, but it could Trivia. mean just uh, commonly called Roma. I think. Uh, okay. I think I. I guess, but. Monica, do you have I, the same view? Okay, so it's commonly, but yes, I mean, in this manuscript, the French uh, cities, uh, this is one of the clues that have led the um, editor, uh, you know, the, of the manuscripts to uh, state that the author is Provencal because the Provencal cities are in French. 
even if the text is in Latin. So again, this, this will guide her. Maybe I should make a little footnote and, uh, and uh, um, expand a bit on this. Thank you. Um, well, I think what we'll have to do now, um, we have one more question because we have a, an important event after this. Actually, it's and a suggestion perhaps. Uh, no, thank you, Claudia. That was a lovely, lovely paper and uh, uh, touching two of my favorite topics, Roman Avignon, in illumination. Uh, that's what I work on. Uh, there's a, a, a manuscript, perhaps going back to the tiles on the floor in the 1381 chapel, maybe an image or an echo of an image of that sort of chapel from the palace is in one of the manuscripts illuminated by Jean de Toulouse, who was Clement VII's uh, official illuminator um, uh, in his payments. Uh, it's not a manuscript for the popes, but it's a manuscript for a bishop, a Spanish bishop, um, Juan Guzman de Villacretes, the, the bishop of um, Calahorra. And it's dated 1389, so it's very close to, to the date. And it's actually a, a pontifical it's more beautiful than the ones that uh, the pope paid for so probably the bishop was paying better and it's got a lovely depiction of a chapel the bishop seated on this lovely tiles uh pink and green which are the colors that are documented in the papal palace so that might be a, a similar and there's also politic it's it's on uh, on the cover of my avignon illumination book so uh, you'll be familiar so maybe that might be uh, the sort of uh, floor that um that also yes. documented through the archaeological resonated in those mm. and another thing there's a, a not a spectacular manuscript but with interesting it's a, a devotional miscellany and uh, with an office of Saint Martial and this is earlier this is from the 1350s and 60s so this unusual and rare office of Saint Martial and it's I connected it at the time 20 years ago to uh, um, a French illuminator copying uh, Matteo Giovannetti in a very poor sort of way but basically uh, echoing and in uh, among the texts there's an officium panorum domini very unusual i haven't found and uh, there's also a french young man trying to work on it from a textual point of view uh, recently uh, mentioning all the cloths connected with christ from the the crib the cloth in the crib to his uh, the, um, the the virgin's um clothing made for Christ, all sorts of clothes connected with Christ. So could that be perhaps uh, a link to the relics you were thinking about in the Saint Martial Chapel? Well, I, actually, uh, I mean, this, this connection with Christ sounds very interesting to so me I'll, I'll because uh, of Urban V's uh, interest in uh, the face of Christ, mm -hmm. uh, in the Sudarium particularly. Yes. And I think this uh, identification by this time with of the pontiff with the popes mm -hmm. and uh, and even this that the recent you know recently published um, uh, document of Urban the fifth commissioning fifteen uh, Veronicas from from Giovannetti yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I think is interesting in in this respect I mean this yeah. kind of a connection of so I'll, I'll give you the identification of exactly it, exactly that would be great story. thank you so much well uh, Claudia you've given us a great deal to think about and I think the people here have given you a lot to think about as well I'm sorry we didn't have time for all of the uh, online questions, but um, we have an important uh, event that's going to take place uh, for everybody in the hall here. Uh, in the portico uh, above, we are going to toast John Osborne and his new book on Rome in the ninth century uh, over a glass of wine, uh, but not before uh, thanking Claudia once again for her wonderful Avonier's uh, microcosm. <laughs>